All right, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Dave Barbier. I'm the sustainability coordinator here at the university. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to have you all here. I'm totally, fills my heart to see so many people interested in hearing from Rob and his stories about um, what he does. Uh, and I'm not going to go into much more than that. Uh, I'm going to start off with just a few basic logistics and thank yous to get us started. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, a UWSP alum to handle the official introduction of uh, bringing Rob up here. Um, so. Uh, I just want to again say thanks for being here. This is the earliest event our office has ever tried to pull off in a school year. So uh, getting this done only a couple of weeks in is pretty amazing. Uh, we started planning it in the middle of July. Uh, so for those of you who know, like there's not a lot that happens on our campus in the middle of July. So making this a reality has uh, been a bit of work, but uh, I think it'll be worth it. Um, uh, the, the first group I want to thank is just our Office of Sustainability staff. Um, if it wasn't for them and all the hard work that they put into our events uh, and just everything that we do on campus, uh, we would not be able to put this on and offer it to you. So a big thanks to them. Um, I want to thank uh, all of our different sponsors uh, who have uh, financially helped to back uh, having Rob here. Um, to me, it's really... Uh, exciting to see so many different groups uh, take interest in terms of what we're doing. So we had two academic departments that financially backed this, um, the School of Health Promotion and Human Development, uh, as well as the School of Education. Um, as it relates to those two sponsors, if you are a student and either want to get a wellness credit or business credit for being here in attendance, you need to slide your student ID right there. Corey will be there uh, through the end of the presentation. So as you're leaving, if you want credit for being here, make sure you sign in and slide your ID. Um, then as it relates to student orgs, we had uh, three uh, specific student orgs help us uh, financially. So that's the um, Students for Sustainability, the um, colla collaboration, I don't think that's right, of organizational leadership, the cool group from the TNR, uh, and the Waste Management Society. Then we, had, uh, we have a 350 Stevens Point chapter, uh, which is a nice mix of students and community members, and they also help to uh, sponsor the event. And then lastly, probably what I'm most excited about is that we had two community organizations also contribute to this. So the Recycling Connections Corporation as well as the Stevens Point Co-op. So um, having that really diverse mix I think is really powerful just to show uh, how we can work together to get something done and how this sort of message radiates not only for students and classes but to the community and what, what we're trying to do. So uh, if I could just get a round of applause for all those groups for helping to make that happen, that's great. Um, next, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Kelly Adlington. Uh, she is a former alum, or she is an alum, uh, of the university. Uh, she graduated here in 2017. All right, uh, with a waste management degree. Uh, currently, uh, she's one of the cooperative uh, owners of Rising Sands Organic Farm, as well as the uh, main driver behind and literally the main driver for curbside compost. Um, so that's pretty great. Uh, that is our curbside composting collection uh, in town. Um, she also works for Recycling Connections and really provides a lot of great community education. So um, she's somebody that I'm really impressed with and I'm happy to know. And lastly, she taps a mean beer and she spins great tunes on 90 FM. So uh, with Without any further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Kelly to uh, get us rolling. All right, we got to work the mics here. Okay, is that good? I don't know if I need to check with. Great. Okay. So, yeah, hi, I'm Kelly. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I know you. <laughs> Uh, as Dave said, I, I work for Recycling Connections. I'm a member owner of Rising Sand Organics. I'm at the radio station and the brewery in Amherst, and that's pretty fun. Um, but tonight, I'm, I feel so privileged to be here right now, so thanks. Um, so a few weeks ago, Rob Greenfield made a post on social media 
about harvesting the meat from a roadkill fawn in Wisconsin. And this resulted in a lot of lost followers for him on social media, but in a follow-up post to that initial post, he, he maintained the stance on the matter that life is just graphic sometimes, and it's never black and white. He also noted that the meaning of posting about that experience in general didn't really go, did not go as deep as simply eating roadkill animals. The deer, he said, was a vessel for a bigger lesson. What I love about the work that Rob does is that it takes our day-to-day -day routines, the habits that we get in ourselves, whether for comfort or for convenience, and even the mindsets that we cultivate within ourselves and within our friends, and it sets it all on a much bigger stage because the lessons that we learn are much bigger behind everything that we do. Rob reminds me that what I do matters, who I am matters, who we all are totally matters. And we can't really hide from that anymore, so we might as well accept and embrace it. The bigger lessons that we learn are endless. And while that sometimes feels daunting, the only way to tackle it is with honesty. Facing reality with equal truth and rawness is going to be the only way to survive that. And Rob exemplifies truth and rawness in everything he does, in addition to unyielding conviction and the sincere. Rob Greenfield. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. That was the best introduction ever. <laughs> thank you. Um, hey, everyone. Great to be here with you today. I just got to point a couple hours ago, and it's already been a beautiful couple hours. Is the mic on right now? I don't really hear it. It is? It's not room support. It's just for the live stream. Oh, OK, cool. So I'll, I'll make sure to speak up. Everyone can hear me all right? Yeah. All right. So uh, well, thanks for putting this on, and thanks for bringing me here. I'm actually in uh, Wisconsin for a couple months. I currently live down in Florida, but I'm from Ashland originally. I spoke here three years ago. Any, was anyone here three years ago? OK. All right, well, there's going to be you know, some repeats, so hope you're not too bored. We'll, we'll switch it up a little bit, though. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really wonderful to be here with you all. So I'm going to get started and uh, give you a little disclaimer before I get started. And that is that um, a lot of the projects that I do are sort of extreme. I embark on environmental activism campaigns and adventures. And the idea is really to catch mainstream media's attention, to catch people's attention and get them to think about important environmental and social issues. Um, so we live in a time when there's you know, thousands and thousands of messages being sent our way every single day where we're just being bombarded. And so I do things that are a bit extreme to really you know, move, get, you know, compete against all of that media and try to put positive messages out there. So the disclaimer is that you don't have to do these extreme things. It's really just about thinking about our lives, self-reflecting and asking what can we do to live in a way that's beneficial to the earth, our communities and ourselves? What, what can we do to live in alignment with our beliefs, where our actions are in alignment with our beliefs? So that's the point of tonight. And uh, so one of my projects is the food waste fiasco. I've dived into about 3,000 grocery store dumpsters across the United States to show what's wrong with our globalized food system. One of the big things is how much food we're wasting. This was the first one I ever did. It's in Madison, Wisconsin. And this is two days worth of dumpster diving at grocery stores. We throw away half of all the food we produce in the United States, about $165 billion worth per year. Um, but most of us don't necessarily wrap our head around big numbers, you know, bat, no matter how big they are. So a lot of my work is designed to be visual, to help us understand these complex issues with some fairly simple visuals. Uh, another one of my projects was called Share My Way Home. So the, if you turn on you know, mainstream media, if you turn on the news, Often you could walk away from that thinking the world is this dangerous, violent place. There's a saying in media and that's, if it bleeds, it leads. I was just hanging out with two of my friends that work at a local news station and I said, what's going to be guaranteed on if it happens? And they said, murder. That's going to be top of the headlines every time. 
And uh, if they, they fit about 18 stories in, and they said maybe three will be positive. So that's what, if you're consuming you know, the mainstream media and the news, you might think the world is this very dangerous, bloody, violent place. And that stuff does exist, but I actually believe that most people out there are good. So to put that to the test and to create a different narrative, I landed in Panama from San Diego with just the clothes in my back and passport, so pretty much like this except I had shoes, a hat, and a passport in my pocket, and I had to travel seven countries home just dependent upon the kindness of others and some resourcefulness. And after 37 days of traveling, I got back to my house and I felt myself and I was like, whew, I'm still here, I still exist. And the only words that I could really mutter out of my mouth were just, people are good. That's, that's all that I really could feel after that adventure. Another one of my projects was Trash Me. And so the average American creates four and a half pounds of trash every single day on average, but never really has to think twice about it. We put it in the garbage can, the garbage truck comes and picks it up, and then it's out of sight, out of mind. So the idea of this project was um, I lived like the average person. I ate, I shopped, I consumed like you know most of us are accustomed to. But the exception was I had a specially designed trash suit, and I had to put all of that trash onto it. So this is day 30. Uh, I created 87 pounds of trash, and um, I didn't go out there and I didn't tell anybody what to do or that anything that anyone was doing wrong. I would just walk around and people would ask what I was doing. They said, oh, I'm living the average life and wearing all my trash, and you know, people would see it without me having to tell anybody anything was right or wrong. So after five years of simplifying my life, I got my life down to 111 possessions, and uh, we see this trend in society right now, which is having more and more possessions. The average American might have somewhere between, between 10 and 30,000 possessions, tens of thousand possessions, to the point where if you tried to sit down and just touch everything you own, it would become your full-time job for weeks on end just to see everything that you own. And at the same time, we're seeing our houses um, going from the average size of a house has gone from 1,500 square feet to 3,000 square feet. So we're seeing average house sizes double with less people living in them. So we see these trends towards more stuff and, and, and bigger houses, but at the same time, we don't actually see health and happiness going up as well. And for the first time, we actually see life expectancy possibly decreasing. You know, one interesting thing is that suicide rates are higher, which is not exactly a sign of, of happiness. So we see an increase in stuff and possessions, but we don't necessarily see an increase in health and happiness and people feeling purposeful. So I uh, lived in a 50 square foot tiny house, which is very small, smaller than this screen actually. And the idea of it was really just to get people to stop and think, do these bigger houses make us happier and healthier, does more stuff? And so again, a lot of these things are, are quite extreme. I've taken things to the extreme. But the idea of tonight is not that you run out of here wanting to live in the tiniest house you can find or dive into all the dumpsters in Stevens Point or wear all of your trash. Although you're all welcome to do that and I will support you if you do. I think you just, maybe you said you want to go dumpster diving? Yeah. <laughs> you want to go dumpster diving? All right. We might have to do that. So the point is you don't have to do any of those things. Again, it's just thinking about what can we all do as individuals to improve the world around us to live with our actions in alignment with our beliefs? So just keep that in mind and don't feel overwhelmed with the, uh, you know, the extremeness of it. So um, to rewind a little bit, I wasn't always an environmental activist. I didn't really think about my actions and how they affected the earth. Um, so this is me. Whoops. Oh, that's me uh, right here. In college, I went to school at UW La Crosse, and uh, at that time, I had a lot of goals. My goal was to be a millionaire by the time I was 30 years old. I was very focused on material possessions, financial wealth, you know, very ego-based, living a life based on what people would think about me. And uh, one of the reasons I was doing that is because my goal was to live sort of the average American lifestyle. That was I was drawn to the American dream at the time, whether that was from mainstream media, looking at the people around me, or combination of those things, that was kind of my goal. This is the way that I expressed that. In college, it was just the standard thing to do to get drunk and party, and that's what I saw in the movies and such. Um, 
So I was extremely passionate about this during that time. This is a night in uh, freshman year of college. For those of you who don't know what this is, this is called a duck bong. And it's like a, it's like a beer bong, except it's a plastic ornamental lawn duck. You cut one of the holes, you cut one of the feet off, and you cut a hole in the beak, and this fits like five beers in it. So um, this is, uh, yeah, it was what I was very passionate about at the time. I also had a part-time job during university, and that was going to the library for like 20 hours a week and talking to uh, all the women there and inviting them to my parties. And when I was un unsuccessful at that, I'd run into uh, unlucky Christmas trees in our house. So you could say I was a tree hugger back then, but in a little bit of a different way. Um, so the reason I'm showing you all of this is, obviously this is, eh, it could be a little embarrassing. That's why I put this nice blank slide here so we don't have to look at that anymore. But the reason I'm showing that is to just show you where I was just 10 years ago and that I decided to change my life and where I, you know, I've come to now. So a lot of people would think that to go from not really thinking about my actions at all to this extreme that maybe I must have had some sort of, you know, major moment of enlightenment or an aha moment or something like that. But I didn't have anything like that. It was just simply that I started to educate myself. I started to watch a lot of documentaries. I started to read a lot of books. And I started to realize that basically every action that I was taking was causing destruction to the world that I loved. You know, because the thing was I never didn't like people. I never wanted to harm other species or the environment. But I just didn't know. And then I read these books and watched the documentaries and started to realize, dang, pretty much my life is just destroying the world around me. And at that time, I had actually, actually kind of thought I was doing a pretty good job. In college, I was the one who you know, would recycle all the beer cans and the, the beer bottles after the parties. And uh, when my roommate Ricky was leaving the faucet on while brushing his teeth, I would yell at him and tell him to shut off the water. And you know, I thought I was kind of the environmentally friendly one. But um, you know, so at that point, I could have felt total doom and gloom. I could have felt you know, very helpless and hopeless that my life wasn't what I thought it was and that it was you know, largely sold to me by corporations and that you know, the food I was eating was coming from factory farms, the car I was driving was part of the reason that we have war, that 10,000 oil spills happen per year uh, to put gas in my car and the other cars and the trash I was creating was going to sit in a landfill for basically eternity as far as we're able to look at it. Even the water that I was drinking in San Diego was being shipped across a desert where half of it was evaporating or going into the ground and running the Colorado River dry. And so, you know, I could have felt totally hopeless. But instead, I actually felt really excited. I felt really empowered because these documentaries and books didn't just tell me the problems, but they actually talked about the solutions, what I could do to be a part of the solution. So what I decided at that point to do was to change my life. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to change my life overnight. So I made a list of goals, a list of changes that I wanted to make. And then I, I wrote that out, typed it up, printed it out, put it in my kitchen with a uh, pen taped to a, a pen tied to a string, taped to the wall next to it. And my goal is that each week I would make one positive change and just be able to check off one positive change in transitioning my life. And I started with you know, a lot of really small things. At that time, I went to Walmart for all my groceries. So, and I double plastic bagged everything. So you know, simply, an early small change would have been not using plastic bags anymore and carrying reusable bags. Or, uh, but, but I also sort of quickly moved on to some bigger things. I realized, well, everything here is wrapped in plastic. Maybe I just shouldn't go to Walmart at all anymore. And all this stuff shipped from around the world, maybe I should just buy less of it. Maybe I could support local farmers. So I started to go to the, the farmer's market rather than going to the big box stores or the local hardware shop rather than the big box stores. Started to ride my bike more and drive the car less. Um, started to eat more whole foods, less processed packaged foods. And uh, just started, you know, was really questioning everything. I thought about the deodorant I was putting on my body and the, uh, you know, shampoo and conditioner I was using. So changed the things, you know, all the natural, switched over to more ha natural hygiene. Um, and so basically over a period of about two years, by making one positive change per week, I 
made about 100 positive changes uh, over a period of two years. And what happened was, you know, the idea of these changes was that I was trying to live a more environmentally friendly life. But what I found was that it was actually making me a lot happier and a lot healthier. I stopped doing duck bongs and started drinking water and, you know, healthy drinks and food instead. And I lost 15 or so pounds riding my bike. Rather than being sitting in traffic and banging my head against the steering wheel and being angry, I found myself just a lot happier on a bicycle, getting fresh air. Um, so I found that these changes that were generally more beneficial for the world were also more beneficial for myself. And that made it easier to make more and more positive changes. And basically what I found is that I was sort of creating the foundation towards a more sustainable life. So I had these bigger goals. Like one of my goals was to get rid of my car and just have a bike and use public transportation. And at the time, I didn't even know if that was really possible. You know, I grew up in this society where your car is many things. It's not just your transportation, but it's also your image. Um, you know, growing up in northern Wisconsin, I remember if, a, if there was an adult driving a bicycle, riding a bicycle with, like, street clothes on, you just assume they probably got a DUI and couldn't drive a car, and that's, you know, why they were doing that. And so it was also the social stigma of it. So, um, but what happened is I biked a little more and a little more and a little more, and then I just decided I was going to park my car in my driveway for a month and see if I could do a month without my car. And I did that, and it worked. So after a while, that you know, by having made those smaller changes, then I was able to get rid of my car complete, completely. So after about two years, um, I felt like I had gone from maybe a level 10 or a level 9 hypocrite, you know, way up there down to maybe level 5. I felt like I could maybe go out there and talk about this now and uh, try to inspire people and, and also not just inspire people, but just give people an option. As I said, when you turn on the TV, it's not like it's really this uh, conducive world to just make yourself a better person and be good to the world around you. So, I just thought, well, I can at least just put the option out there and, 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 and put it out there. So my first adventure was to uh, bike across the United States uh, and try to do it off the grid. The idea was to bike across the country and have no negative environmental impact. So I left from San Francisco, and I had 4,700 miles to Vermont. And um, the rules were basically in order to try to live sustainability to the extreme, I set ground rules for all of the basic aspects of sustainable living. So food, water, energy, waste, and transportation. These are the things that pretty much every single one of us deals with pretty much every single day. So for food, I could only eat local, organic, unpackaged food. So in California, you know, that would have meant food from California. Organic meant not sprayed with pesticides, didn't have to be labeled organic, but maybe I stopped at the farm and talked to the farmer. And unpackaged meant that there wouldn't be any trash left behind after eating it. So this was a, a, you know, a stop in California. It was pretty easy there because half of the United States food is produced there. But uh, getting to Nevada, I made it to a desert, so it was harder. But I also quickly learned the term food desert. And a food desert is just an area where there, there is no access to, to healthy food really, hardly even bananas or oranges or just the basic fresh fruit. So I had made one exception, and that was that I could go dumpster diving, because that food was already wasted, so there wouldn't be any negative environmental impact by eating it. So that meant diving into dumpsters. And the first time that I was going to go into a dumpster, I was pretty nervous. Like, well, I don't know. I'm guessing some of you are dumpster divers here. I won't make you raise your hand in case you're, you know, not. There we got a few. All right. Oh, you're a dumpster diver too? Cool. <laughs> is he? Yeah. Not no, yet. Not yet. <laughs> After tonight or tomorrow, he is. So um, I was, I, just imagine if, for those of you who haven't dumpster dove, that you couldn't eat tonight or tomorrow unless you dug from a dumpster. You'd probably be a little anxious, and that's how. That's how I felt. You know, what are people going to think if they know eat, I eat out of a dumpster? And will they take me seriously? So the first time that I ever went to a dumpster, I sort of quietly snuck around back and peered inside the dumpster. And sure enough, there was, you know, pretty full of food. And uh, there was zucchinis and there was soy yogurt. And, but what I had my eyes on was a half gallon of ice cream right there on the bottom. And 
I picked it up and sure enough, still cold, opened it up, still frozen, just a little melting around the side. And uh, I didn't have a spoon with me that day, but I had my sunglasses, so I just dug in right there <laughs> in the parking lot and ate about half, three quarters of that half gallon of ice cream. And from that point on, I found that just dumpster after dumpster after dumpster all across the United States was filled with perfectly good food. I would just go, I, you know, I still would go into the grocery store and ask, like, do you have anything local, organic, unpackaged? And they would just look at me, like, you know, what are you talking about? Most of them just had no thought about where the food actually came from. We, I think there's more thought about that now. This was only six years ago. Times have changed a fair bit already in that regard. But, you know, most people just looked at me pretty clueless. So after a while, I just stopped going into the grocery stores, and I went around to the treasure chest out back. And... Uh, 70% of my diet that summer ended up coming out of the grocery store dumpsters. This is a dumpster in Holdridge, Nebraska. There was enough food in this dumpster to feed dozens of people, probably 50 families for, for a weekend. And uh, this is just what I pulled out in a matter of five or 10 minutes. Um, so on this trip for water, I couldn't use any water from on the grid for the summer. So no turning on a faucet to fill a water bottle, no flush toilets, no showers any of the ways that we're accustomed to using water. Instead, I had to harvest my water from a natural source, lakes or rivers. Here, I'm using a purifier that pumps the water through a ceramic pump and purifies it, and then it's good for drinking. Um, so in the entire summer, I used about 160 gallons of water, which is what the average person uses in about two, uh, two days. The average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons in the United States. I also had an exception, and that was that I could use water that was going to waste. So this was a leaky fire hydrant in uh, the Bronx that I filled my water bottle from. So for electricity, I couldn't use any electricity from on the grid. So for that whole summer, I couldn't have been giving this presentation, couldn't have you know, been touching this thing. The only electricity I could use came from my little solar panels. So you no know, plugging into an outlet, using an air conditioner or a fan. If I wanted to go into a store that had only automatic doors and didn't have like a door I could open, I had to wait till someone else walked in and then <laughs> jump in with them. And so what happened was I started to learn how electrified my life was, how I was using electricity at almost every waking second of the day. And uh, it wasn't until I actually got halfway across the country to Colorado, I visited a business uh, that's job it is to get uh, Facebook and Google, big companies to switch over to renewable energy. And what I learned was every time I put something online, like a photo to Facebook, a video to YouTube, a blog, I was doing it all with my solar powered laptop, but all of that was being uploaded somewhere. And what, where that somewhere is, is a server. And all of those servers take an incredible amount of electricity. And every time I put something online, that was living online. So I was using more electricity every time I added something to my online world. But the thing was, it wasn't, what allowed me to get to this point of really understanding all of this was stripping my life back to the basics. What I learned is that we live in a globalized time where our actions are mostly outsourced. In the past, it was fairly easy to understand how our actions affect the world because we were surrounded by our community, and what we did was usually through interactions with the people around us just a few hundred years ago. Today, almost everything we do impacts people around the world, from the cell phones and computers we use, to the, even the plastic pens, to the tables and the seats, to the building that we're in, to the electricity that produced it, the electricity that makes these lights. Basically, everything we do has an impact on people, other species, all the way on the other side of the world. Um, but so for me, you know, the reason I was able to start to really fully grasp that and understand that is because I simplified my life for so much for that summer that I was able to sort of pull at those strings and unravel things and start to understand my life to a, a much greater extent. So. For trash on this trip, every piece of garbage I created, I had to carry across the country with me. So if I created garbage like the average American, like I showed you earlier on, I physically wouldn't have been able to bike across the country. But by, create, by 
forcing myself to create so little trash, I created about two pounds in the, in the summer, which is what the average person w would create by about one o'clock or two o'clock in the afternoon on any given day. And then uh, lastly, for transportation, I had to bike the entire way. So no using fossil power, fueled powered vehicles or even electric vehicles, even on the off days, no buses or, or, what, or, or such. And um, as you can imagine, you know, 104 days of living sustainability to the extreme really, you know, solidified a lot of this in my life. They say it takes 21 days to form a habit. So 104 days really deeply formed a lot of these habits. And the trip was, you know, largely life changing. But for me, it was actually a lot more about the bigger picture of what I got out of it. You know, I'm a young, I'm still young, but even then I was a lot younger and, and a guy being able to bike across the country is something that I can do far easier than a lot of people and something that a lot of people can't do. Um, but I, you know, learned the, powerful, the power of a bicycle. I met women that were 70 years old that were biking across the country and they had, uh, you know, their husbands following them in campers that would meet up with them every night and they'd have a nice warm meal in a bed, but still 70 years old and biking across the country. And uh, I met people that at the time, I thought were far too large to fit on a bicycle, you know, 150 pounds overweight, but biking five miles to work and back. And I met kids that were five years old that bike into school with their parents. And so I started to see how, you know, applicable of a, applicable of a tool the bicycle is and how far it can take us both literally and figuratively. So when I got back to San Diego, which is where I lived, I still had a three bedroom apartment and uh, I got back there and I found it to be a little difficult. You know, I would go back to the old ways of water being infinitely on the tap or seemingly infinite and same with electricity and I'd find myself wasting like I didn't want to because it was so easy. Um, so I decided I was going to live, sort of try to create this adventure again but in the city and gonna, I was going to live off the grid in a tiny house. Um, and so what I did is I went on Craigslist, it was New Year's Day 2015, and I, I was planning on buying a camper to live in while building my tiny house, and I went on, and I just typed in tiny house to see what would pop up, and this popped up, and it said tiny house $950, and I thought, that's got to be a typo, it's got to be $9,500, I mean, $950 less than a month's rent for most people in San Diego. But I put $1,000 in my pocket, I biked up to the place that was seven miles away, and I quickly realized why it was $950. It was five feet wide by 10 feet long, so I could not stretch out like this. So it was about this wide, actually, and 10 feet long, so not quite to the front row, maybe, maybe to about here. And uh, I couldn't, in the middle, I was, uh, I'm 5'10", and I think it was 5'6", so I could just barely kind of stand in it. But I thought, you know, okay, this is extreme. This would be a you know, great way to get the media to, to talk about this and be able to talk about some bigger picture stuff. And sure enough, I didn't even get the house home. It was still sitting in the street in front of the guy's house, and I already had Channel 10 over there. And uh, was able to you know, use it as a way to, to get the conversation going about sustainability. So here, I focused on the same five basic aspects of personal sustainable living. Food, water, energy, waste, and transportation. For food, the, uh, the idea was to grow some of my own food. I had some wicking bed gardens here, which for those of you who don't know, San Diego is a desert. We get less than 10 inches of rain out there per year. Here you probably get 60 inches of rain per year or something of that sort. And not only was it a desert, but it was actually in the middle of a mega drought in 2015. So I did not grow uh, by any means all my food. I tried to buy mostly local food and then grew a little bit of my own. But I did live off the grid for water, so no, no faucets or, or flush toilets or anything of that sort. A lot of people would think that it might be impossible to live just off rainwater in a desert in a mega drought, but you would be surprised at how much water you can harvest off of a roof. The average American-sized ho American house can harvest over 10,000 gallons of water per year. So I didn't harvest all that off of this tiny little roof here. Whoops. <laughs> I actually set up the rainwater harvesting on my neighbor's roof so that I could harvest a lot more water. And um, one of the lessons that I really learned here is that uh, 
most things in life are a matter of perspective. So, you know, I really focus on sustainable living, but this applies to pretty much everything. Um, with this being an example, so the average American uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water per day. The average Western European uses about 50 gallons of water per day, so about half. And the average uh, Sub-Saharan African, which is 50 countries over there, uses about two to five gallons of water per day. So to the average American, it would be just insane to live off of the amount of water that the average person in Africa does. That would be just one of these per day, or, or, or even half of that. And to the average person in Africa living on two to five gallons of water per day, it would be insane to use their entire day's water with one flush of a toilet. And so I really started to see that most things in life are a matter of perspective. Um, what I started to realize was normal is just a matter of seeing the same thing around you over and over and over again. So what we do in the, here in the United States seems completely normal because every, most people around us are doing it as well. But when you actually zoom out a little bit, you look at the statistics, the United States has 5% of the world's population but uses 25% of the world's resources. So that by definition is not normal. That by definition is actually extreme. In order for the world to meet the demands of everybody, if, we, if everybody lived like American society, we would need five worlds. You just can't physically do that forever. So the way that we live is actually really extreme. And so more and more I started to realize that what I'm doing isn't actually extreme. The only reason that I appear extreme is because I am just showing the opposite end of the spectrum of something that is already quite extreme. So again, normal is just a matter of seeing the same thing around you over and over and over. And when I realized that, that's one of the things that really allowed me to step outside those boundaries and, and experiment and see what was actually possible. Realizing there's thousands of different ways of doing things there's thousands of different cultures out there, and none are, none are necessarily right or wrong. It's just different ways of doing things. So at the tiny house, uh, well, just to give one example of using water uh, to you know, get a lot out of it. So that two to five gallons of water per day, because I used all of it a second time to grow food, was more like four to 10 gallons of water because I used it at least twice. So for electricity, all the electricity that I used came from these small solar panels. Now, a lot of people, when they think of sustainable living, they think of, you know, $30,000, $90,000 electric vehicles. Teslas are considered sustainable. A lot of people think of solar systems on the roof that might cost $15,000, $20,000. And so that's one end of the spectrum of sustainable living. Now, the thing about that end of the spectrum is that's only accessible to the top few percentage of the wealthiest people on Earth. For most people, what sustainable living is, is simply having a whole lot less. When I started to see that most people who actually lived a sustainable life were doing so because they just had a lot less than the, per the average people around me, that's when I started to realize that maybe what it is is the less needs you have, the easier it is to meet those needs. So with solar, for example, if I used as much electricity as the average person in San Diego and I had a refrigerator and a, you know, and a toaster and a hair dryer and you know, a leaf blower and an electric car and all those things, I wouldn't have been able to afford that. I had $15,000 to my name at that time. Um, so what I did is I simplified my life. I got rid of almost all of my electronic items. I figured out ways to exist without electricity. By doing that, I had, uh, was able to use just a $1,000 solar system. So what I found more and more is the more that I reduced my needs, the more that I was able to easily meet them and instead spend my time doing other things, which for me, my passion of other things would be helping other people meet their needs who don't already have them met and, and you know, helping other people live more sustainably. Um, so, okay, we're going to talk about poop for a little while, which is actually my favorite part of the talk. It's, this is about five or ten minutes, so I'm actually going to set that thing down for a minute. Um, so, one of the really big things that I kept coming back to, I, I realized that our lives today are extremely easy overall, compared to 99.9% .9 of the experience of the human race in, in history. 
and they're extremely convenient. I mean, we can get almost anything we want and have to do almost nothing for it except hand over a little bit of money or swipe a card or type in some numbers, on, numbers online. And so I started to ask, you know, why are things so easy and why are things so convenient? Like, how does this work that today it's just so easy? And what I kept realizing was the burden is being placed elsewhere. It's not that the burden doesn't exist, it's just that it's been outsourced. So as an easy example, take driving a fossil fuel powered car. You sit down, you put your foot out, you're going zero miles per hour, you simply put your, your ankle forward and now you're going 60 miles per hour in five, 10 seconds. So very easy, compare that to walking, riding a bike, riding a horse, sailboat, you name it. So where's the burden being placed? So just a few examples, you have 10,000 oil spills that happen per year, just routinely. We hear about the big ones, but there's 10,000 per year. And that's just part of pulling oil out of the ground or sucking it out or however it comes out. And then you have, you know, the, we don't really have oil refineries here. Most of them are down in Texas, Louisiana. There are some, I know there's one big one over in Minnesota. But the people who live next to these oil refineries down in Texas and uh, Louisiana, a lot of them have two to four times higher rates of cancer and respiratory diseases. So that's another place where the burden is being placed. So I started to think about the flush toilet. Talk about easy, you poop, you hit that little lever, your poop's gone, don't have to deal with it, unless it clogs, you know, sometimes. But for the most part, you hit that lever and it's just gone and life is easy. Don't have to deal with the poop. So I started to think, well, where is the burden being placed there? You know, who's paying for this convenience? Why is this so easy? So there was the obvious, you know, 1.6 gallons of water per flush. That's what a billion people around the world have for an entire day. Um, and you could say, well, we have no shortage of water in Wisconsin or Minnesota. And the same amount of water exists today on Earth as it did when the Earth was first formed, supposedly. I can't verify that, but I can, you know, generally believe that. But uh, the thing is that 20% of our electricity is used for pumping water. So when we use water, we're also using electricity. All of that water had to be cleaned, which means using chemicals, chlorine being one of the main ones, both before it gets to us and then after it gets to us again, more chemicals. A lot of that water is not being returned as clean as it was when we found it. So those are some you know, elements. But what I started to realize was that also the system doesn't work just as we had thought. So I was in Vero Beach, Florida, um, and I was reading the newspaper front page and it said, three million gallons of raw sewage spilled into the river. And I don't, it said the name of the river, I don't remember what it was, and I thought, whoa, three million gallons, that's a lot of our poop and pee and whatever else we're putting in the toilet, Drano and such. It's like, that's a lot. And then the subline said, fourth largest spill in two years. And then I started to realize that actually this is extremely common, that the system you know, has its pros, but it also definitely has its cons. And there's obviously a downside to putting all of that into our bodies of water. So that was kind of, you know, for me, one of the reasons that I decided I was going to start using a compost toilet and not sending my burden to somewhere else, but actually dealing with it myself. And it is a little bit of a burden to deal with your own poop. Um, now, this was another thing like dumpster diving that at first I didn't necessarily want to tell people about, like, you know, guys, pooping in a bucket, guys dealing with his own crap. It's not exactly cool, although maybe in point it's kind of cool to, <laughs> yeah, I see some, yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, but, so I decided, you know, in the fashion that I do things is that I would just kind of put it out there big and bold. So I put out my first YouTube video and it just said, I compost my poop. And I got responses that I expected, you know, there was the obvious like, ew, this is nasty. Um, you know, this guy's using poop to grow food, that's gross. And then there was other ones that, you know, one common comment was this guy's going to die. He's going to, you know, get sick from doing this and he's going to die. Who's going to take over his YouTube channel? <laughs> other people would say uh, he's not just, he's not going to die. He's going to kill the whole city of San Diego. <laughs> and to them, I was able to explain, actually, I went to school for biology and I was able to explain how composting works. It's pretty simple. The pathogens in our body are designed to live at about our body temperature, about 98.6 degrees. What happens with a compost pile is 
Okay, so everybody's probably seen a compost pile, whether it has poop or just yard waste and food waste in it. You put all of that there, and then what happens is insects, so microorganisms, which would be bacteria, and macroorganisms like insects, they go to that pile, that food waste, that yard waste, that poop, whatever you put in there, and they're going to eat that and break it down. Everybody here has farted before, and probably none of you have had a cold fart. Farts are warm, and they're warm when they come out of uh, the bacteria as well. Gas is generally warm. So what happens is you have millions or trillions of, of things in there farting warm gas, and it heats up, and the compost pile gets up to about a, can get up to about 160 degrees. So those pathogens are basically cooked in there that are designed to live at body temperature, and that's the basic biology, or would that be chemistry, I don't know, of why composting poop is, is safe and how it works. So I was able to explain to people, this is why I'm not going to get sick and die, and this is why I'm not going to kill anybody in San Diego. But at the time, the other thing that, you know, as I said, they were just saying, you know, ew, this is nasty. And to that, I just had to say, yeah, I guess I see where you're coming from, because I assumed they were not eating food that human poop was used to grow. And then I actually read a book called Wasteland by Elizabeth Reut. And I learned about where does America's poop go. I was in New York City at the time. Um, and uh, the book was placed in New York City. So imagine there's 10 million New Yorkers. Imagine each New Yorker poops one time a day. That's 10 million poops. Some do four or five times. Some I hear only poop every three weeks or something like that. But let's average it out to one a day. 10 million poops. That is by all standards, a lot. So what happens to it? It goes to a wastewater treatment plant. And then what happens is there's bacteria at that plant that break it down. Now, 10 million poops is broken down to about 10% of the volume. So you're still left with the volume of 1 million. What they do is then they heat it up using, actually, I don't know how they heat it, probably a fossil fuel of some sort to create the heat. Um, and then. Uh, that kills the pathogens in it. And then what happens to some of it is it's put on rail, shipped down to places like Florida and Texas, where it's then laid onto the farm fields to grow America's food, which is then shipped to the grocery store where people buy their food and then eat food that millions of Americans' poop was used to grow. So at least now I'm able to finally say, well, actually, you're eating food that poop was used to grow, and actually mine is only like five or ten of my friends. Yours is just a bunch of strangers in New York City. <laughs> um, and I should give the disclaimer, not, not all food by any means is, has human poop being used to grow, but it is, it is absolutely something that's, that's been done. You can retrace your food and find out if that's the case for you or not. All right, that's the end of poop for now. <laughs> but um, you do have the, the ability to ask any poop questions you have, uh, after I'm done talking in the question session. Um, so I, at the beginning, I forgot to mention that there was someone, when I first started dumpster diving, she was back in San Diego at the time. I was biking across the country, diving into dumpsters. We were still talking on the phone quite a bit. I was very, very much in love with her at the time, and she was mm, kind of interested, at least a little bit interested in me. We were, I mean, we were on the phone most days. And she told me on the phone, Whatever you do, don't tell anybody you're dumpster diving. So at first, I, I really, I did listen at first. But then the more that I did it, the more that I saw, this is just it's absurd. I mean, I started to learn, like I said, that we waste $165 billion worth of food per year. That's more than the budgets for America's national parks, public libraries, veterans health care, the federal prisons, the FBI, and the FDA combined. It is a huge amount of money. We waste enough food to feed an entire another American population. You could make another American population and we produce enough food to feed that while 50 million Americans are food insecure. So as I started to see this, I just thought, yeah, I, I just have to talk about this. So I didn't really listen to what she said. Um, fast forward a year later, and her name is Cheryl, and uh, we ended up being partners for four wonderful years. So this is proof that you can eat the trash and have the girl too. <laughs> and uh, honestly, she never once got in the dumpster in all those years of dumpster diving, but she did stand next to the dumpster and I would pass the boxes out to her and she'd put them in the car and she even did some food waste fiascos with me. And really one of the biggest lessons that I've gotten through all of this 
that's really, I guess, allowed me to do what I am doing is just that I just stopped worrying what people would think about me. Um, growing up, I, I would say Wisconsin is a place that, of all the places, I, I did spend the most time worrying what people thought about me, especially growing up in Ashland, a population of 8,620, small area. And I started to think about it, and I thought, if you just spend one hour of your day, so imagine you get up, like what I did is I would gel my hair, and some years it was like, you know, the gel and the, the ramp, I don't remember what that style was called. Some years I grew up my hair long. You saw the ha in, in the early college one. The reason I had wings is because sometimes I would blow dry them with the hat on to get them to, to wing out. Or I would put on my hat while it was still wet and go for a bike ride if it was nice out before school to get them to, to wing up. And, you know, I, the, all the things, worrying about acne and, and, and all of these things, I realized that a lot of times I was spending a good hour a day just on that element of what people thought about me. And if you just spend one hour a day of your life and you live to the average life expectancy, you will spend three years of your life worrying what people think about you. You can get a PhD after, graduate, or after undergraduate school in that amount of time. And I just started to think, how could I use this time more wisely than worrying what people would think? So I decided no longer would I look at the lens of what people would look at life through the lens of what people would think. Instead, I would look at the life, my life through the lens of, is this beneficial to the earth? Is it beneficial to my community? And is it beneficial to myself? Is this the life that I want to be living? And so that's really what allowed me to, to break free from all of that and forget about the social stigmas. Because for most everybody that I talk to, when they're trying to figure out how to really live sustainably and live out their passion, What's holding them back more often than not is social stigmas. It's just worrying what will their family think, what will their friends think. And, and, and so that would be if I could go back to myself as an as a elementary school age, a middle school, high school, college student, would just be, that would be the number one thing I would say is just, you know, don't worry what people think about you. And it turns out that it's, it, it's actually kind of the opposite. What I've seen in today's world especially our political world, where you find very few authentic, real people that are out there. I think what people are drawn to today is just people who are who they are, no matter what that is, no matter how absurd it may be. I find that people are just drawn to people who really are them, themselves. So sure, you know, I, might have, I did lose some friends by changing my life and not having the same interests in them. But those relationships were replaced by other relationships over time. So uh, I've done about 15 food waste fiascos across the country. This was the third one that I did. This is Detroit, Michigan. And Detroit was a place that I was not sure if I was going to be able to pull it off. You know, probably all of you have heard, you know, Detroit's had some rough times. And I didn't know, would there be a lot of food waste there with things, you know, with people not even having electricity or clean water? And uh, so when I woke up, it was a Sunday morning. I, had, uh, I woke up at 7. I had the demonstration planned for 5 p.m. I had already invited the local media like I always did and actually already knew that USA Today and Discovery Channel and uh, Detroit Free Press were going to be there. So I had 10 hours to pull it off, and I was pit in my stomach. I was pretty worried if I'd be able to do it. Dumpster diving in a town I've never dumpster dove in. At 7.15, um, Seth and Julie picked me up. They were some volunteers that were following me on Facebook. We went out dumpster diving, and all my worries were for nothing. This is what we had collected by 9.15 a.m., and we had to stop because the SUV was filled, back seat uh, and trunk, top to bottom. So this is two hours of the dumpster diving in Detroit, Michigan. This is Cleveland, Ohio. It was 95 degrees that day. This is seven hours worth of dumpster diving. These are, you can see there's enough bananas to feed everybody in this room, maybe even to split a bunch between, you know, every other person. And this is 10% of the bananas we found that day. You can imagine if it's 90 degrees outside, dumpsters are metal boxes. They can heat up to 120 degrees, so a lot of the bananas had gone bad. Um, they were good when they went into the dumpster, but 120 degrees, that bakes a banana. So this is seven hours in Cleveland. This is Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And uh, I got there at, I think, about 7, 8. And this was four hours of the dumpster diving in two cars. 
So Lancaster is not like super rural, but it's not a big city like Chicago or Detroit. So it was interesting to see that it could be done even in rural-ish United States. <coughs> this is Philadelphia. I got there at 9 p.m. Um, someone with a car on Facebook uh, took me out dumpster diving. I just used maps on, on uh, Google, typed in grocery store. We drove around back. And by 1 a.m. we were asleep. So this is less than four hours of dumpster diving in a city that I had never dumpster dove in before. This is New York City. It has one of the largest populations of people without homes, you know, sleeping on the streets. And this is just a tiny sampling of food that goes to waste from just a tiny sampling of the stores on one night. This is Burlington, Vermont. Uh, Burlington is a, you know, a fairly progressive place. San Francisco of the East, I've heard it called. Uh, Bernie Sanders is from Burlington. So I was a little worried, you know, would I be able to do a food waste fiasco there? Um, the good news is that, well, the bad news is yes. This was two days worth of dumpster diving with college students. The good news is that everything in here was actually being composted. So it was in compost dumpsters. But the bad news is that all of this is perfectly good food that was being composted. So let's take an apple, you know. Not an apple from your tree in the backyard, but an apple that's from the globalized food system. You could think composting that, well, it's being recycled, so everything's great. But what it turns out is that when we compost perfectly good food, we recover less than 1% of all the resources that go into producing that food in the first place. There's the fossil fuels used in the farming, the fossil fuels to ship it. A lot of, if next time you go to see where your apple's from, it might be Chile or New Zealand. Um, there's the pesticides used. There's the human potential. Uh, people who spray Driscoll strawberries have often two to four times higher rates of cancer. And half of that for, to end up in the dumpster for nothing. So when we waste perfectly good food, that is all of the resources that we're not able to recover at the same time. Another food waste fiasco, this was San Diego, California. And people would always, people always wonder, like, well, what did you end up doing with all this food? And my intentions was never to feed 50 or 100 people. I mean, I don't know, that's enough food to feed quite a few people. But my intentions was never just to feed some people this weekend. My intentions with this project is to, to affect change, to, you know, raise awareness about the flaws of this system, get people to step outside that system, get people to work within the system and change it. And that was really my goal. Um, but people would always say, well, what are you doing with all this food? I mean, can we buy it? And I'd say, no, it's from a dumpster. I'm not selling it. And they'd say, well, can we eat it? And so I'd always say yes. And most of those pictures you saw, I hadn't even finished setting it up and already a bunch of the food was gone. So there was more than that. After a while, what I started to do is I would say, okay, the demonstration is from 11 to 3. And then at 3 o'clock, the food is free for the taking. So this is just before 3 o'clock. And then this is 3 o'clock in about 15 seconds. <laughs> so all of these food waste fiascos, probably over 1,000 people ate from the dumpsters. And uh, to me, that is the proof, one of the biggest signs of proof that this food is definitely still good. People from all walks of life came out and ate from these dumpsters, from literally millionaires to people that had no food and were sleeping on the streets, from 80-year-olds taking home a big old ham loaf from the dumpster that was still good to, you know, moms with their five-year-olds going home and making food from it. So to me, that was just really one of the biggest, you know, realizations that this food is definitely still good. So uh, my current project is a little bit, it's sort of the opposite of that. I've learned that I could live off of just food waste and I learned the problems with that system, so I wanted to step outside that system. So for one year right now, I'm growing and foraging 100% of my food. Today is day 312 of the year, so I have 53 days left. And uh, the idea is, I have this question, is it possible in 2019 in this society to grow and forage 100% of your food? And so far, 312 days in, I can say that at least it's possible for me to do it. I can't say anything about the bigger, the, what anybody can do. But um, the bigger picture has just been learning what we can all do. We can't all grow 100% of our food, that's for sure. But it does look like that 
within our cities, we could grow all the fruits and vegetables for all the fruits and vegetables for our community. And that would totally change our entire food system. So right now I live in Orlando. I built this 100 square foot tiny house uh, and that's where I currently live. I don't own any land. So I grow all my food on what were front yards. I took six yards and turned them into gardens and the owners get to eat all of the food they want. So this was the first garden that I started uh, and that was about four months later. A lot of my current projects are very much focused on community. You've seen some of the things I do are sort of individualistic with my attention grabbing tactics, but really I believe that community is the, is the answer to most of our problems, that the only way we'll solve our problems is by working together. Um, so one program that I started is gardens for single moms. So we, we create gardens for single parent families to help them grow food uh, for, their, for their kids and their family and to share it with their community. Um, we also started the Free Seed Project. We've sent out 5,000 uh, garden starter kits to people across the country that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford or access seeds to start their own gardens. Um, current project, we have planted over 200 community fruit trees. And those are fruit trees that are publicly accessible to anyone. Uh, they could be in front yards, along the sidewalk. This is a median between the sidewalk and the street. And, um, Right now we're planting 100 more this fall and we just put that out this week. So if you're interested in getting fruit trees planted in Stevens Point, you can email growfood at robgreenfield.tv and that's uh, where Lexi, my helper with that, will get back to you about planting community fruit trees. And then I also teach free gardening classes in my community just to help people to grow, grow their own food. Um, so in closing, you know, a lot of people ask, well, Rob, what's the point in trying? You know, you're one in seven billion or I'm one in seven billion, so what's the point in even doing anything? You know, can I, can I make a difference in this world? And um, my answer is yes. And the reason why is not because I actually think that things are going to go extremely well for society. I actually don't necessarily see things working out in the long run for the human race. I, I don't know, but that's just, that's just my opinion. So, so even then, it's like, so why try? And the reason that I try, and the reason that I want other people to try, is because I believe that life matters. I believe that the life of every person in this room matters. I value my life, and I believe that my life matters. I believe the life of every species, the four to 20 million species that we share this earth with matters. Even what? The dinosaurs. Even the dinosaurs, they mattered too. Or the dinosaurs that still li live. So I, believe, I really believe that, that life matters. And so it doesn't matter what's going to happen 100 years or 300 years or 1,000 years from now. Yes, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. That does matter. But that does not affect why I shouldn't try to have a positive impact on the world around me. I don't like making people frown. I like to make people happy. That's a good enough reason to try and, and to, you know, to think it matters. So, um, so, you know, it's in the bigger picture, like none of us are going to be able to say, maybe you're focused on, on trash. Maybe you don't like to see Maybe you've seen the pictures of turtles choking on garbage or, or birds with their stomachs filled. And so maybe you think, well, I can't clean up all the garbage in the ocean. But what if you can come together with your friends and you can clean up the lake or the river and make that a more beautiful place for yourself, for your community, for the other species that live there? World hunger. There's a billion hungry people in the world. There's people that starve to death every day. None of us can fix that. Even if all of us put together our resources in this room, we would not solve world hunger. But what if there's a neighbor that lives next to you that hasn't had a healthy meal in weeks and you can share that, you can grow some food and you can share that and you can cook with them? You know, what if it's an elder that, that doesn't get out and you can make their day and you can improve their life? You can't solve world hunger, but you can change the world of the people around you through your actions. So that, that's why I think it, it makes sense to, to, to do this. Um, so my hopes is that, you know, coming out of here, you don't feel overwhelmed, but instead you maybe have thought of one thing that you can do to improve your own, to improve your own life, to improve the community around you. You can take that home. You can write it down on a piece of scrap paper. Don't use a new piece of paper. Find a piece of scrap tape, tape it up there. 
and um, write it down, and then commit to making that change. And then when you've made that change, however long it takes you, then make another one. And then when you've made that change, you can make another one. And just keep doing that over time until you become the change that you wish to see in the world. And maybe you go from a level 10, 9, or 8 hypocrite down to a 5, 4, or 3, or whatever feels right to you. So thank you all for uh, being here today and for, you know, to Stephen's point, and Kelly and Dave for putting this on. And it's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, we got plenty of time for questions still, right? And uh, also, I'm here for a couple days. Happy to hang out, do some foraging, dumpster diving maybe, biking. Yes. Huh? Oh, oh, Kelly asked, yeah, she reminded me. I'm also, I'm speaking in La Crosse next week. And uh, if anybody is driving to La Crosse this week or this weekend, I'd like to catch a ride with you. <laughs> or if anybody just wants to go on an adventure, uh, you can uh, send me a message online. So, yeah. Questions? Or, or, or applause. And uh, yeah, if you need to leave, feel free. Don't worry about it. And uh, no question is too crazy. In fact, I appreciate the crazy questions. Was that a wave or a question? Oh, goodbye. OK. Uh, so tell me about your toilet paper. Um, do you get it out of, do you dumpster dive for toilet So his question was, tell me about your toilet paper. Um, I have dumpster dove for a lot of toilet paper. Places like pharmacies throw away 24 packs when they get smashed. So that's, so I've, I have done a lot of that, but I actually, so I haven't bought toilet paper in five years. And in Florida, I grow my own toilet paper. It's a plant called Plecranthus barbatus. And uh, here you have mullen, M-U-L-L-E-I-N, also called lamb's ear. So you have naturally growing toilet paper, and if you use a compost toilet, it goes right into that compost toilet. If you don't have a compost toilet, you can have a little uh, garbage, not a garbage can, because it wouldn't be garbage, but a bucket, and then you can compost it. So uh, if you go to robgreenfield.tv slash toilet paper, that is a blog on 10 ways to wipe your butt for free. <laughs> and I've done all of them, otherwise I wouldn't recommend them. So our question is, did I shower at all? I actually did uh, 1,000 days without taking a shower, a personal challenge. It started with the bike ride across the country, no showering for 104 days. It went so well, I felt so good. Turned it into six months, made it that far. Turned it into a year, made it that far. Thanks for coming, guys. Nice to see you. Turned it into 1,000 days. So I do occasionally shower, but for the most part, I swim in natural bodies of water, lakes, rivers, oceans, wherever I might be. How do you make money? All right, so the question is, how do I make money? She prefaced it by saying this might be a bit personal. I highly doubt that you could possibly answer a ask a question that would be too personal. <laughs> so I, I guess I challenge you to ask a question that would be too personal. The reason I'm happy to share the personal aspects of life is because, I mean, that's, you know, it's life. You know, sustainability and, and all of this, it, it is life. Every aspect of our life is, is the question. There's the questions. And also, I know that I do things in a not so typical way. So I'm happy to provide that insight. So the question again was, how do I make money? And also, it's asked every time. So it's a standard question. I make money from Stevens Point. <laughs> no, I do, <laughs> I do make my money from public speaking. Um, I have set a personal income cap of making no more than what's considered the federal poverty threshold, which for an individual right now is about $12,000. This year I've made $9,700. That's all I'll make for the year. I've made enough. Last year I made $8,000 and the year before that I made $5,000. So mostly what I do is I live extremely simply. The less needs I have, the more easy it is to meet those needs. I would never, like, for example, I'm not staying in a hotel, I'm staying with Kelly. She gave me her bed, which is really nice, and she, but she's got an awesome attic to sleep in, so she's actually got the better spot. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> so I just live extremely simply, and 100% uh, of my media income is donated to environmental nonprofits as well. So the TV shows that I've done, the books, all of that goes directly to nonprofits because my goal is not to make money through this, and my goal is also to keep myself doing things for the right reason, and I do find that money... Uh, can really distract from that, but uh, so yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so our question is, uh, when I did a thousand days without showering, did I use uh, deodorant or antiperspirant? No, and I actually gave up deodorant as one of my earliest things because one of the things that I learned, one of, it was really big learning about what I was doing to my body. Antiperspirant, if you don't know, is designed to make you not perspire. So the question is, if our body's perspiring, is it not supposed to do that? Our bodies have developed over millions of years. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So do I want to prevent that? I learned that there's actually blockers, and I think it's aluminum, and that is something that may be associated with cancer or, or Alzheimer's. Whether or not that's true, it doesn't matter to me. My body's designed to sweat, so I'm going to let that sweat out. Smells. The body, it, it, my question is, is it natural to have no smell whatsoever? Probably not. Um, I don't want to smell horrible, but am I OK with having some smell? Yes, and actually, if you go a little further, it turns out that we may be attracted to each other based on smells. So if we let our smells through, we may actually find the loves of our life. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciated and loved the smell of my partner, for example. That might sound kind of weird, but that's, that's uh, you know, a little, being a little bit more human. So I haven't used deodorant in, since 2011. You are all welcome to come up, give me a hug, and you're even, you know, welcome to give a little sniff if you want. There's a little bit of a smell today, but again, I don't, I don't mind. Um, you said earlier that, uh, like, possessions and everything actually decreases happiness, or is it just as it looks like it does? Have you ever felt, or what have you felt the most lack of down with yourself? What have I felt like the most, lack of, like you're missing out just in life? Like, yeah. yeah, so our question is, what have I felt the most lack of, lack of you know, from downsizing my life and such. So a lot of people think that when you get rid of stuff that you're giving up. And what I learned is by getting rid of what I didn't need, I actually was creating space to fill my life with what I wanted. So the less stuff I had, the more time I had to actually be doing what I wanted. At that time, maybe I loved traveling. By having less stuff at home, I needed less insurance, less maintenance. For example, back then I had a cleaning person come in. But once I simplified my house, it was so much easier to clean and I didn't need that anymore. So the more that I gave up, I found the more that I actually received. And the same comes from giving to others. You know, I'll be the first to say that I am not altruistic and I am not selfless at all because I benefit so much from what I do for other people. The thing that, one of the things that makes me the happiest is making other people happy. It's like when you see someone else laughing, you're more likely to laugh. And it's the same thing. So, um, I, so like to answer that question a, a little more directly, like what do I miss? Um, sometimes I miss convenience and comfort. You know, I've definitely made my, less le my life less convenient and less comfortable. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm riding my bike on a cold night or a rainy night or getting destroyed by mosquitoes and I bike past this well-lit house and see people sitting at the dinner table and I'm like, oh, that looks so nice right now and I get a little lonely. I get lonely sometimes because I am off doing things on my own a lot of the times. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, life definitely has its challenges, but... If I was to replace that back with more consumerism to meet those things, would I be happier? No, and in fact, I would probably be less happy because what, what makes me the least happy is hypocrisy and not living out my beliefs. So I find that life is hard no matter what you're doing. If you're living and you have all your needs met and you're, but, you know, you're working 60 hours a week and it allows you to buy all the fanciest foods and have the nice car and the nice house and everything, that there's still going to be some, there's, you're going to have challenges there, whatever it is. And if you live simply and you, you know, pass on all that stuff, you're still going to have challenges there. So I believe that life is hard. I think it's delusional to think that life would just be easy. And so I, I just embrace that. No matter how we design our lives, there's always going to be challenges and just embracing that reality. I also miss chocolate. So when you're not <laughs> home with your garden, what do you eat? And you can't just go to someone's house every meal. So, yep. so what do you do when you're not at someone's house and you're not at your garden? Yep. So for this, you know, the question is, what, do I, what am I doing while I'm traveling for growing and foraging all my food? So in Florida, 
uh, I had the six gardens and I do a lot of foraging. I have a freezer there to preserve stuff, so it's much easier traveling. I left Florida July 13th and I'm going back or October 5th. So gone for about three months. So I brought a lot of food with me. I dehydrated a lot of food. I made flour. Um, one of the keys is, you know, if you have a sweet potato this big and a lot of that's water, you can shrink that down to this big and all those calories are still there. So I could travel with a couple duffel bags rather than, you know, I brought like 300 pounds of food basically. And if I hadn't dehydrated, it would have been insanely more. But now I've used most of that food and I do an incredible amount of foraging. I am confident that you could live in Wisconsin 100% off food without even a garden, just from foraging. Except for salt, you'd have to take a trip down to Florida or to the east or the west coast to make your salt. But basically, the, the resources are, are here. So like right now, for example, I'm getting into wild parsnips and you can dig up hundreds of pounds of wild parsnips. Uh, so uh, yeah, I still eat some food from Florida, but every, you know, I've, I've eaten 260 different species since starting this project and I've harvested over 60 in my time in Wisconsin learning most of those from scratch. Two books I'd really recommend are uh, Forager's Harvest in Nature's Garden. They're by Samuel Thayer or Sam Thayer. Website is foragersgarden.com, I believe. But just Google Sam Thayer and it'll be the first thing that pops up. Two of my absolute favorite books. And there's also foraging classes. I just went out foraging with a guy um, in Florida, or sorry, in Madison. And if you go to my Facebook or Instagram, you'll see the picture of us. And it has his website and he teaches foraging classes. He actually has one Saturday if you're learn, interested in learning about that. Is there any foragers in Stevens Point? Uh, any foragers in this room that like to have uh, other people come out with them? That maybe? Mm -hmm. Shy foragers. Yeah. Is there any foragers that teach classes that you know of in Point? Yeah. Do you? What's, oh, where are they? We teach at the service school, which is a high school for uh, this is semester school. Okay. Cool. So is that something anybody here can take classes or no? No. Okay. Have to be 16. Have to be 16. Okay. <laughs> so start with Sam Thayer. I was just saying, we've actually, we're from Point and we've gone to Sam Thayer's class. Oh, yeah? It's cool. Around. It's great. Yep. I believe, uh, a few weeks ago, I met someone, his name, I believe, was uh, Patrick Schmidt, and I think he is, lives in base out of the Stevens Point, but I saw him in Wassa. He was teaching about uh, mushroom forest. Okay. Cool. St. Patrick Schmidt, maybe? Mushroom forager? Other questions? Uh, I have two meat-related questions for you. Okay. So one, uh, going back to Kelly's introduction about the deer, it seems like in your project now you're not eating a lot of meat. So I'm curious how your body physically reacts to that. So that's sort of like my first question. And then is there seeing your sort of homesteading gardening in Florida, I would naturally sort of think like, oh, you could probably, you know, grow chickens with the compost you're generating from that. So did you think about that? Did you choose yep. to do that or not do that? And why or why not? Okay, so yeah, um, the question is about uh, eating meat, the roadkill deer that Kelly mentioned, and then possibly having chickens in Florida. So actually what you said is that it looks like you're eating less meat. I'm actually eating the most meat right now that I've ever eaten in my entire life because it is extremely abundant in Wisconsin and because I'm harvesting roadkill deer, which is a really interesting thing. I was vegan for two years from 2014 to 2016. So I just want to say that I never expected to be standing in front of a room talking about roadkill deer, but it seems to come up in every one of my talks now. So I'll have to just get used to that. Um, but uh, so, what's exactly the question again? How so, okay, yeah, it's like how your body reacts to that. Do you notice any like sort of physical change by like not eating meat and then all? Yeah, the well, or... personally, for me, when I was vegan, I became extremely deficient uh, over time, and when I started to eat some meat again, I actually started to feel a lot better. My belief is that nothing is black and white, and that everything is gray. So. You know, when I was vegan, I kind of believed this idea that veganism was the most sustainable diet. 
I kind of believe this idea that all humans, you know, can easily be vegan. I actually think that was flawed. I think that it's a w world of seven billion people that have, you know, uh, evolved in vastly different ways. And I think that the reality is, is it's a very diverse world and that something that works amazingly for one culture will be an utter failure for another culture. I think the key to success on this earth is diversity. In any natural environment, the, you need diversity. And I think it's the same with, the, with human beings as well. Um, so, you know, that's kind of my thought on that. I do write extensively about that. If you go to robgreenfield.tv slash veganism, that's like a third of a book on my thoughts that go deeper into that. As far as chickens, I, didn't have, I don't have chickens during this project because for in order to have chickens, I would have had to have grown and forage 100% of their food as well, and I wouldn't have been able to buy grains or the vitamin mixes for them, and I was not prepared to do that because I wasn't knowledgeable enough and I wasn't willing to do a poor job of raising them. Yeah? What did you do with all that stuff when you took it off? So the question is, what did I do with all that trash when I took it off? Well, initially, the plan was that every night, or that I'd wear it 24-7 for the entire 30 days. Then I realized, I really don't need to have it on at home. Like, it's just about making an impact. So I got a um, mannequin, though, that I put the suit on so that it would look at me, at least, at all moments. It was about day 10 when I put it on the mannequin, and the mannequin shattered to the ground under the weight. So then I had to wear the mannequin for the rest of the project, because that was <laughs> trash. <laughs> so there's a big old mannequin stuffed in the back. Um, so after the project, I held onto the trash for a while, because this, this suit was used for, um, I let other people use it uh, for awareness campaigns. And then after a while, though, I decided to get rid of the trash and then just because like, I brought it to Europe and did some talks there and such, and it just didn't make sense to ship 87 pounds of trash when you could just fill it up with trash there. So eventually I recycled the recyclables and the trash went to the landfill, which is another example of black and white. It's like some people comment, this is a horrible project. Why would you make this trash? You should live zero waste. My belief is that this visual and this project reduce trash by thousands of folds of that you know, impact of just not creating that trash in the f first place, and really far more than thousandfold. Um, this trash suit will be on display at the Atlanta airport for all of 2020, so if you fly in and out of there, look for the trash suit. So do you only eat roadkill meat? So the question is, do I only eat roadkill meat? No, I also fish, and I have not found a roadkill fish, ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As of now, oh, I actually, I did trap squirrels in my garden in Florida to, to fully answer that question. They were eating my food, so. <laughs> so in permaculture, the problem is the solution. Yep. Um, spent some time in Alaska, and a lot of the moose that I ate was roadkill, so I don't think you're crazy. Um, what, uh, what are your talked a lot about foraging. Um, what are some of your favorite forage foods that you found, maybe particularly in Florida, and have you given any thought to the sustainability of that? Um, I don't know how far some of this works, but yep. something like ramps, right, where you get down to the meat of it, you're actually going to destroy that yep. plant, right? It's not going to come back. So yeah, the question is, um, uh, uh, what are some of my you know, favorite things that I've foraged, and then what about the sustainability of foraging? So. Favorite things to forage, um, I like anything that is extremely abundant, which actually dives perfectly into the second part of that. I love things that there's a lot of. So right now, I love apples, because there's just unlimited amounts of them. I love chicken of the woods, because you can find a big one and have many meals. I love parsnips, because there's tons of them. I like, I like anything that's invasive, where when you're pulling it up, you're actually doing a service to the environment there. In Florida, I love wild yams. They're invasive, and the biggest one I've harvested is 157 pounds. I weigh 153. So imagine how many meals that makes from one yam. Um, the average one's 10, 20, 30 pounds or so. Still big. Um, 
I mean, I, I love, all, you know, every one of the 260 or so foods that I've eaten. I love wild greens because they're one of the most nutrient dense plants. You know, most wild greens are extremely nutritious. So I love those. As far as the sustainability, you know, of foraging, you know, you see common comments, <clears throat> and I'm sure this isn't the way that you're posing it, but you see people saying, if the whole world did this, we'd deplete all our resources overnight. Well, two things. The world is doing that already, and we are depleting our resources at a, at a rate that is absolutely absurd. Our current industrial food system is not sustainable whatsoever. But more importantly, if the whole world all of a sudden wanted to be foragers, the mindset of the entire world would have drastically changed, which means we'd be thinking differently about our transportation, about how we deal with our water, our waste. We would be thinking about the packaging of our food. We would be totally, we would be thinking different about everything. So if the whole world wanted to do this, then we would be seeing a massive societal shift altogether. But as far as the sustainability of foraging, um, you can do foraging in an extremely sustainable way and even a regenerative way, or you can do it in a way that decimates the area around you. Human beings have decimated a lot via foraging. You know, the pigeon, the carrier pigeon population I've read used to be so large that it blocked out the sun. Literally flocks of millions of birds where you didn't see the sun, I believe for even hours they were flying past. They're extinct. So humans can do a lot of damage. So the key is knowing how to forage. For example, ramps, best thing is, well, well like wild, like for example, yesterday I harvested a whole bunch of garlic. Uh, wild garlic. I didn't dig up a single bulb. I ate only the seeds and the greens. So I didn't reduce it, the stock at all. There's some plants that through disturbance actually can produce more. Um, so, you know, the way that I'm doing it, I do believe is sustainable. Sustainable, you know, that, that, that's a whole word that we could go into. And, uh, but I would recommend uh, reading S Sam Thayer's section on that as well in his books because he does also really dive into that. So when you traveled across the country, you said you kept the little bit of waste on you. It was only like two to three pounds. Yep. Right? So what was that? So what was the garbage that I created on my bike trip where I created uh, about two pounds? So some of it was plastic from food, some plastic packaging. Um, I bought a few things, um, so more plastic packaging from that. I did recycle. I made nine pounds of recycling that summer, which was not included in the two pounds of garbage. So still minimal recycling, but um, what else was in there? Yeah, it was mostly just some plastic because p any paper or cardboard could be composted. Food waste, of course, was all composted. So just random bits of plastic. I recycled all my bike tubes. Um, there was a program that you could, that actually recycles bike tubes. Some bike shops do it, most don't, I found. It's been six years, so it's a little hard to remember what, I, what trash I created in 2013, but it's a little bit. What are your thoughts on recycling? What are my thoughts on recycling? I could sum it up by saying that it isn't the best. Um, Okay, there's what is real recycling. Recycling, the idea, you see the three arrows. There is no exit of that. Recycling means that it continues on and on and on and on and on. What we have mostly in our recycling is what's called downcycling. So it's turned into an inferior product, maybe an inferior product, and then it can't be used again. Paper, for example, once you reduce the size of the, the grains or the threads or whatever you would call that, can't be turned into the same paper, for example. So maybe it'll be turned into toilet paper and then that's gone. Plastic bottles, for example, I know sometimes are turned into benches. Once that bench wears out, that's not recyclable usually. So generally our recycling is by definition not what actual recycling is. And unfortunately, a lot of the Recycling is business. It's about bottom line. It's about profit. There's an extreme amount of corruption in the huge waste industries. It used to be run by the mafia. I think there still is some mafia involved in it. I have friends that are involved. 
in uh, waste manage WM, and they say that the uh, the uh, contamination rates are far higher than they have to be. Basically, some garbage gets in there, and it's just as just as profitable for them to dump it in the landfill, but a lot less work. So they jack up. They just call it a contamination rate because it's easier to deal with. So unfortunately, recycling is is. Uh, is highly disappointing the further you look into it. And my goal is to recycle as little as possible. Zero waste isn't about recycling more. It's actually generally about trying to recycle as little as possible. When I was young, telephones lasted for decades. And you didn't have to go outside to use them either. In Chicago, yep. you picked up the damn phone, made a call, and, and, and you didn't have to go outside, and, and you didn't have to buy a new one every six months. And then when you bought milk and pop, it was in bottles, and you and you drank it, you know, drank it, and then you brought it back to the store. So it wasn't even recycled; it was just like yep. reuse. So you don't have to make all this garbage though. Re reduce, reuse, and then recycle is last. I didn't even know that. It's in order: reduce, then reuse, then recycle. Should we do one more question? Sounds good. All right, last question. Do, you have a phone? do I have a phone? Nope. I got rid of my cell phone in 2000. 14, I think, so it's been five years without a cell phone. Uh, I use what's called Google Voice. I use it on Wi-Fi, and it's completely free to get incoming and outgoing calls and texts, and there's a voicemail. So most people think I have a phone, but I just am available on Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is unfortunately so prevalent that it's hard, still, still hard to disconnect, even though I don't have a phone. Um, so thank you again to, uh, to Dave and to Kelly for bringing me here and to Stevens Point for bringing me. I'll, I'll stick around and uh, hugs and uh, you know, more questions and hang out for a little while and uh, hope to see you around this week, this week as well.